I highly recommend going back and watching part 21 as we continue on directly in that part, so go do that now and I will wait, if not what are you doing come on let go. Sorry, for being gone so long, life's been shit and I'll spare you the whining. To be brief, this is the beginning for the final push. I'm going to preemptively apologize about quality and length, I'm not going to try make it to the actual encounters tonight, just the dozen or so posts of out of combat groundwork. Nothing super interesting, just my expository rambling. Feel free to ditch. I won't be around tomorrow night to make it the rest of the way there, and next weekend is booked, so more blue balling. Incorporated. Sorry. All that said, in two weeks there will be another posting, which should hopefully cover the rest of this little arc and get us to the final actual session of the whole campaign. As a final little note, I'm sorry for all the emails I haven't responded to. I've read them all, but just haven't been able to muster the mental energy for proper replies. So here's a collective, and woefully inadequate. Thank you. Resuming. Finally, from last time. Once we'd been officially inducted into the platoon, with Sludge as lead, issued proper guard fatigues and some disappointingly power packless less guns out of a stash behind the commissar's chair, the trainees brought us up to speed. As it turned out, the four of them, one PDF trooper, scribe, cleric, and no longer ex-con, hadn't been scooped up as part of the whole oak thing. They'd actually been enjoying inquisitorial hospitality since before everything hit the fan. Their team had done alright on their first few missions after graduation, as had the other trainees as far as they knew, but a few months back they'd run into trouble. The PDF trooper explained that it had all been because of our training, you see. While our advice about just shooting anyone stupid enough to mess with the blatantly evil Eldritch artifacts had served them well, we probably hadn't meant that rule to include interrogators. At least not when there were witnesses around. The good news was that thanks to that decision they'd mostly survived that encounter, and the Inquisition investigators had actually agreed with their decision. The bad news was that grunts shooting their superior officers is generally frowned upon, regardless of what organization you're in. Hence the penal legion. They'd been in there for the better part of two months, and since regiments were shipped out every two or three months, that actually made them some of the camp's most senior inmates. They'd arrived at the arrangement with their pet commissar and had been trying to figure out if there was a way to get themselves forgotten when the regiment shipped out, and then the interrogator had turned up and started talking about how Oak wanted to help them escape, not being chumps. They hadn't believed a word of it and told him as much, until the man finally admitted he needed their help for something and would arrange for one of Oak's allies to extract them all together afterwards. Our former trainees had been a bit dubious, but the interrogator had obviously been some sort of legitimate, because right after he'd arrived the penal legion had started being assigned work details around the nearby sections of HQ. Somehow he'd gotten their squad permanently assigned to groundskeeping duty at a complex just down the road, and had been devouring their reports on the place's layout and exterior security these last few weeks. Of course, being an interrogator, the man had been tight-lipped about why they were doing all this scouting, but given that the largest building in the complex had mundane evidence storage written on the front, it didn't take a genius to figure out he was planning some sort of heist. Their theory had been reinforced by the contents of the interrogator's secret stash under the barracks floorboards, which they'd discovered and rifled through about 10 minutes after the man had set it up, and happily cracked open to show us. Aside from the booby traps, which they declared to be decidedly substandard compared to what which had tested them on, the stash contained an inquisitorial stormtrooper uniform, complete with a badge identifying the interrogator as an inquisitorial HQ guard, as well as some sort of weird data slot with a badge slot, and several stacks of notes and blueprints focused on, and under, the evidence building. The final item, tucked in the very bottom of the stash, was a three ring binder titled The Loyal Servant of Mars, MK, 121 HS Etheric Variable Discipline Collar, Sacred Diagrams and Maintenance Hymnal. Tink immediately sees the technical binder, and after a few seconds of perusing, demanded a mirror and a Type 5 combi tool or the closest thing the trainees had. The ex-con raised an eyebrow at him and then shrugged, fished a large slightly bent screwdriver, a cracked shaving mirror, 
and a few homemade metal shivs out from under the commissar's filthy chair, and told him to go nuts. After a few seconds of dismay staring at the proffered tools, Tink huffed, snatched them up and went to work. The rest of us watched as the techie began scraping the blunt screwdriver around the seams of his collar in search of something or other, and alternated between cursing at his tools, as well as whichever cockboy had written the manual, and flipping between three different technical diagrams. After nearly a minute of this, the former cleric suggested he worry about the collar later. The interrogator had been trying for days and hadn't even managed to get his collar's cover off. Tink assured him that it was because the man was a technological idiot who didn't know a diode from a donut, whereas he could read a circuit diagram with both eyes closed and had spent the last year studying technology so advanced it made the mechanic a simple little toys look like, um, simple little toys. The trainee nodded and agreed, and suggested that it might also have something to do with the fact that the manual was for a completely different model of collar than the ones we were all actually wearing. One without the special anti-tamper feature, or so he'd heard. Tink paused, and then very slowly pulled his tools away from his neck and suggested that it might be better if he started with someone else's collar first. Everyone in the room took a step backwards, except for Twitch, who suggested that maybe this sort of thing should be left to the demolitions expert instead then grabbed the screwdriver and instructed Tink to hold still. Tink decided he'd rather not do this, and darted behind the comatose commissar with Twitch clothes on his heels. While Tink and Twitch bickered, the rest of us perused the interrogator's notes on the evidence building, but it was all disappointingly rough. There were several different possible entry points marked on the diagrams, along with little notations about pros and cons, as well as several instances of Ask Team's technical demolitions expert about X. Given that said experts were busy playing ring around the commissar while a harried trainee tried to keep them from waking the snoring man up, we decided those could wait for later. The one thing in the notes that really jumped out to us was a complete lack of any sort of objective marker. Everything was either about getting in or getting out, but not a word on where to go afterwards. Noticing our confusion, the ex-scribe pointed at several strings of numbers and letters jotted along the side of one of the pages. He said he was pretty sure the shorter one at the top was the storage unit I'd code for Oak's case, and that the rest were the ides for the individual pieces of evidence he wanted us to steal before his trial the real question, according to the former PDF trooper was just what the hell piece of evidence in Oak's case locker was so bloody damning that having it spontaneously disappear would actually improve things Sarge, torn between relief that at least some fragment of operational security had been maintained and feeling like a hypocritical ass, informed the trainees that they really, really, didn't need to know. Sarge's non-answer was accepted by the trainees with only a moderate amount of grumbling about him having become one of them, and over the course of the evening a plan was formed. Well, it wasn't exactly a plan per se, more of a chore list. For starters, Sludge wanted to have a look at this evidence building himself, so the trainees did some more fiddling on the napping commissar's data slips to get him included on the groundskeeping detail. While Sarge was out scouting, the rest of us were to put our heads together on the whole collar problem. After a lot of inane argument, the technical side was assigned to Tink and Twitch, and the pair were given firm instructions to start by actually reading the outdated manual instead of just looking at the pictures. They were going to need some proper tools of course, which was Nubby's job, along with the ex-con who said he already knew some guys. Finally, since nobody present was willing to let Tink or Twitch fiddle with their collars, Doc was asked to go to provide a corpse or seven. The medic had objected, loudly asking why we expected him to just have a bunch of dead bodies lying around. Tink pointed out that A, he was an Imperial Guard medic and B, this was a penal legion. The only real problem would be finding ones that still hurt their heads. Doc grumpily ceded the point and promised to go volunteer for the legion's medical corps. The final chore involved the numbers from the notes, or to be more precise, the very similar one Sarge vaguely remembered seeing on that little please collect your stuff slip mixed and without transfer orders, the ones that the old commissar had walked off with. According to the trainees, they'd have been filed away in the commissary command post and none of us stood the slightest chance of getting anywhere near them. Luckily for us, we already had someone on the inside. All we had to do was figure out a way to make contact without raising any commissarial eyebrows. 
The trainees asked if we meant that sister who'd come in with us, and were advised not to call Amy that to her face if they valued their teeth. The next morning we got our first taste of life in an inquisitorial penal legion. They day started off at 6 with a public execution, followed by a fiery sermon from the legion's head priest, some sort of redemptionist pre-center we guessed based on all his stuff about cleansing sin through glorious death. After the sermon we there was a roll call, in which a slightly disgruntled cadet stood in for the commissar we'd been left snoozing in his slightly damp chair, and we moved on to some good old guard issue PT and dummy weapon drills, and finally another public execution before lunch. Honestly it was all sort of homey, just like being back in one of the training regiments, if a rather disciplinarian one. Okay, maybe disciplinarian is putting it a bit lightly, by lunch the death count was up to 7. And we were pretty sure the commissars had some sort of daily competition going on to see who could get the most whippings in. Aside from the big public executions, which the trainees said weren't actually a pre-meal tradition, that morning was just busier than usual for some reason. The leading cause of death appeared to be summary execution at the hands of the cadets for minor, possibly imaginary, infractions. This behavior didn't really surprise us. Anyone who's met a baby commissar could have told you there's a reason why they aren't given authority to shoot guardsmen until a tour or two has mellowed them out a bit. It did strike us as a bit wasteful though, even if penal legionnaires were considered even more expendable than your typical guardsmen, if that's even possible, one had to wonder how they were managing to keep the legion from dwindling away to nothing before it ever saw combat. That little question was answered for us just after lunch, when an Anabite convoy escorting four whole buses of new recruits rolled in. According to one of the trainees, the four buses full of new arrivals were the Arbite's weekly delivery of fresh meat. See, there were two types of legionnaires in the camp, and lucky mud feet and disgraced inquisitorial agents only made up about a quarter of the legion. The rest consisted of the hard and dregs of the planet's criminal underworld, unlike us guardsmen who accepted our sorry lot fairly easily, the assorted gangers, assassins, heretics, and occasional outright lunatic chafed a little at their new strict military lifestyle, and apparently the more organized members harbored some downright lethal bad blood for each other. Anyway, as the buses unloaded, an entire platoon of legionnaires jumped some of the new arrivals. Some of the cadets moved in with their shock sticks to settle things and one of them got a bit too cocky and wound up yanked into the melee, which was when their seniors stepped in and we got to see our fancy discipline collars in action. All at once, every collar in the large radius started beeping and almost everyone, including us, froze. But the Malay's participants were a bit too wrapped in things and didn't stop until their collars went from beeping to an electrical buzzing and they all flopped over into the mud in a twitching heap. The old commissar strode out of the crowd followed closely by a pair of toadies as well an unarmed cadet we belatedly recognized as a very stiff and unhappy looking Amy. While a few cadets pulled their comrade out from under the pile, the old commissar fiddled with the fancy data slit like the one that was kept under our commissar's chair and very abruptly three of the legionaries in the pile didn't have heads. Without a second glance, the man turned on his heel and walked off again, only pausing to instruct a squad to clean that up and shoot an unreadable glance at Amy when she began to lag a little behind him. The markswoman immediately sped up and didn't so much as glance in our direction. Afternoons in Camp Redemption were a little more free than the mornings. Most of the legion got a second round of drills focused on such complex concepts as which way round to hold Alaskan, ditch digging, and how to serve as a human bomb, but as guardsmen we already knew that stuff. The more senior members of the legion were split up between various work details, which gave us a chance to get started on Sarge's little chore list. Sarge's scouting mission to the evidence building involved a lot more drain cleaning and hand weeding of poisonous xenoflora than the trainee's description of light groundskeeping duty had led him to believe. The PDF trainee apologized, saying it varied a lot day to day, since they were filling in for a whole range of servitors that had been hauled off by the tech priests. When Sarge expressed interest in this, the trainees further explained that it wasn't actually just the evidence building servitors, an entire third of the headquarters corpse bots had been pulled for inspection by a team of Margos. Something to do with the discovery of a shipment of chaos tainted servitor control units with inquisitorial markings on some backwater space station, 
Sludge decided not to ask further questions on the subject. During the periods of time when the cadet overseeing the groundskeeping detail, the same morose looking one that filled in for the commissar during the morning, wasn't watching too closely, Sarge got a good look in the mundane evidence building's layout and outer security. Nothing really interesting jumped out at him about the building proper, but his attention was grabbed by three smaller buildings sharing its end of the compound. The one directly adjacent the evidence building turned out to be a shipping and receiving depot where the majority of the actual evidence being stored came in and out. Judging by the sweating inquisitorial stormtroopers hauling load after load after load of boxes, it was the one menial job in the complex that hadn't been handed off to the legionnaires. The second building spotted had an industrial look to it. The trainees said it was a plasma incinerator used for general trash burning and the disposal of the various evidence that the inquisition was done with. When the cadet commissar wasn't nearby, the PDF trooper quietly informed Sarge that the legionnaire squad currently running it were a bunch of organized locals best not trifled with. More importantly, they were also the primary source of contraband in the camp. The final smaller building wasn't nearly as interesting, at least according to the trainees. They said it was just a laundry processing building, serving both the camp and other headquarters staff in the area. The guys running it were rivals to the incinerator gang, but considerably less organized since two of their leaders had been executed that morning for stealing out of the bins. Tink and Twitch's assignment was a little less straightforward. Sit around in your barracks, where nobody can see what you're doing wasn't one of the available duties, so their official job was assisting our commissar in his functions, both official and bodily. Tink had protested and tried to force the latter part of the job on Doc, but the medic had his hands full working in the camp's medical corps, who'd accepted him without so much a check to see if he knew which end of the scalpel to hold, and immediately set him patching up the constant stream of bleeding legionnaires sent over from the remedial drills. Anyway, fortunately for Tink and Twitch, a few discreet life support features built into the commissar's chair handled the clear parts of their duty, which is why the trainees said they preferred to just leave him in it. The cadet who turned up at the barracks door pushing a pallet had the same disgruntled expression as the one supervising Sarge's patrol, but he brightened up immensely when Tink and Twitch took it from him and scurried off without asking any questions. Once the commissar, who'd attained a vague, profanity-filled semblance of consciousness just after lunch, had been placated with his morning drink, and loaded on the pallet chair and all, he ordered his new handlers on a lovely little tour of the base. Nobody gave Twitch or Tink a second look as they pushed the man around the camp, slurring inarticulate curses at anyone he saw and unsuccessfully commanding the few female cadet commissars to service him. In fact nobody even gave them a first look. Both the cadets and the other commissars avoided the trio as much as possible and did their best to ignore them when they couldn't. Tink and Twitch quickly decided they liked the man. It was like having their very own profanity spewing cloak of invisibility, which only occasionally spit on and threw empty bottles at them. The parade wound up visiting pretty much every building in the camp, with the notable exception of a command post, which the commissar informed the pair was full of piss and busybodies unfit to choke on his massive. Well, safe to say he wasn't on the best of terms with his nominal superiors. From what Tink and Twitch could gather from the little tidbits of sense mixed in with the incoherent ranting, the man had once had a pretty successful commissarial career with some fancy noble regiment. Medals, parades, beautiful women expressing their eternal gratitude to their planet's noble saviors, and all that stuff, right up to the point where literally his entire regiment deserted, not the TAU Empire, Twitch checked. The man had just came back from a trip to planetary HQ with the regiment's other commissar and they were gone. Gear, armor, tents, camp followers and all. Nothing left besides an excessively detailed note telling the campaign's senior brass where to stick it. Needless to say, said brass had been pierced. The inquisition had gotten involved, things had gotten political, and here they were, assigned permanent duty to this shithole. Not to the legion mind, but the camp itself. Everyone else got out eventually, one way or another, but not him or that weasel-faced, self-righteous, ass-kissing, ladder-climbing, lying little shit. His one solace in life was that our glorious deaths would doubtlessly be long, horrible, and probably involve orcs with pointy sticks. Twitch wholeheartedly agreed. 
Anyway, after a final stop at the quartermasters for as much booze as the harried man running the stores would give him, plus a few extra bottles he commanded his minions to cram down their pants when the man's back was turned, Tink and Twitch were free to do as much collar tinkering as they could manage while the old man's increasingly slurred curses transitioned to snores. The cadet never came back for the pallet. Nubby, who'd vanished along with the ex-con trainee, returned to the barrack after everyone else that evening and brought a set of what looked to be homemade lockpicking tools with him. Unfortunately he also brought three legionnaires, one of which Sarge recognized from the crew working the incinerator, and there was a bit of disagreement on the matter of payment. A few bottles out of the snoozing commissar's stash had originally been offered, but upon arrival the biggest of the three men informed us that the interrogator had run up a tab and we'd inherited his debt. Needless to say, we saw things differently, Tink and Twitch were in favor of just killing them. We did have 3 to 1 odds on them and were all armed selection of pokey metal things courtesy of their stop at the quartermaster's office. Doc and Nubby were feeling a bit wassier though, especially considering the way we'd seen the old commissar break up that one fight, so the ultimate decision was left to our fearless leader. Sarge briefly debated the merits of establishing superiority by punching the biggest thug in the snout. Possibly with his augmetic hand, but judging by the trainee's worried expressions it didn't seem like the smartest fight to pick. And anyway, it was a bit early to be burning bridges with our only supplier in the camp. After a bit of arguing and haggling from Sergeant Nubby respectively, the thugs were sent off with as much booze as the trainees felt we could slip out of the commissar's collection without him noticing. The three men smugly thanked us for the interest payment and said they expected more next week. We didn't need the trainees to tell us that the arrangement wasn't going to be a stable one. Okay, sorry to say it, but that's where I think I'll stop it for now. The bit players are all laid out, and the next post reads like I had a stroke while writing it and I don't currently feel up to the challenge of getting it to an actually comprehensible state. We'll spend the next two weeks getting this shit in order and hopefully return with the whole shebang in order. God, I stopped drinking why does all this stuff I wrote during April read like I'm drunk? So yeah, look, I know it wasn't the full story, but he did say in his update, um, this wasn't going to be the case that we weren't going to get the whole thing. And I put it up on what he had on his community tab the other day. So look, I know it's not great, but we'll get there. And you need to remember, I only started the old guardsman party quite late on. So like, you know, there's big gaps in between. Now, this is the biggest gap, of course, but look, we'll get there and it's worth the wait, I think. Like, you know, honestly, it is good. It is fucking high quality, if I be honest with you. Um, So look, we'll get there in time and two weeks isn't that much. Like, you know, come on here. I know you're all biting at the bit to get at it, but like, you know, you're better off waiting for something that's actually better you know what i mean wait for it that's good like you know everyone knows like you know i'm sure most people are familiar with the idea of say like you know like a lushed game like <laughs> do you really want the old guardsman party to turn into the fallout series because that's what'll happen so like give the boy time it's worth it i would say but no um another one before i want to uh i love yous and leave yous is shoggy actually has a mass collection of old science fiction books he's looking to try and sell or get rid of he's just got it's a ridiculous amount it's the pdf is like 100 pages long of just lists of names and release dates and all that jazz so like um i'll throw that the list of books in the description and then check out the thread and all that jazz and you'll see and if you're interested in them um he said in the thread just email them so only email them if you're actually being serious if you see something you actually would like you know so like we'll just get there in time and uh i'll see you then all right bye bye so i've recently moved nick Badia merch over to tea springs and have a few new designs listings are below the video and in the description Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services! It's time to stop!